On the ground, Spider-Man has access to a set of fighting moves inspired by, but much faster and showier than, Arkham Asylum, plus a bevy of web techniques for incapacitating goons. And, of course, he's bantering the entire time. The city is filled with things to see and do, from stopping random street crime to following a story that involves several of Spidey's biggest foes who have all somehow recently escaped from a high-tech prison. Set to release on September 7th for PlayStation 4, Spider-Man seems like it's absolutely nailed the web-slinging and local crime fighter feel that makes the character so popular. Smash reaches its final destination Nintendo's marquee title for this year was Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, a new version of the hallowed fighting mashup for Switch which contains every single character ever featured in the series. Absolutely filled with references to dozens and dozens of games, from playable fighters to items to assist characters to stages to music this is an all-new slugfest designed to appeal to everyone from casual fans to pro-level competitors. And the name Ultimate isn't just to add drama, there's every indication that Nintendo wants this to be the only Smash you'll ever need. It can't be underestimated what a big deal it is to have every single character, more than 60 of them, represented here. It means dedicated Melee players, who still rig up a GameCube to an old CRT TV to play, can move over and know their main is here. To that end the game is also faster, more strategic and supports the use of GameCube controllers. While there were limited players and stages available at E3, it was enough to notice improvements. The game looks gorgeous, and our man Kirby felt instantly familiar even if there had been one or two tweaks to his moveset. Of the characters we played, Link was given the most substantial update, bringing his moves in line with Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. Though it's always been a playful celebration of Nintendo's wide stable of games, Smash now feels as though it's become big enough to be a celebration of, and museum to, itself. Characters like Ice Climbers are more widely known as Smash Fighters than characters of their own game, and combatants from outside Nintendo, like Ryu, Bayonetta and Solid Snake, add to the feeling that this series has now become its own beast. Finally, new characters follow the tradition of bringing elements of their source game with them to smash with Inkling needing to spray ink over enemies to weaken them all lost platoon, and the huge Ridley packing tail whips and claw grinds straight out of a Metroid boss fight. Ultimate hit Switch on December 7th, remake sticks to series gothic horror roots in the mid-2000s, Resident Evil was in a great place. An excellent remake of the very first 1996 game showed the genius design ideas lurking behind the blurry visuals and ancient controls of the original PlayStation, while Resident Evil 4 took the series in a new direction with a modern feel and a more active over-the-shoulder viewpoint. But it all went downhill from there, with a procession of bloated, nonsensical explosion fests which bore little resemblance to the slower, scarier, smarter originals. Last year Capcom essentially hit the reset switch with Resident Evil 7, shifting to a first-person view and returning to an intimate, claustrophobic and terrifying atmosphere. And now it's made what seems to be another inspired move, a remake of RE2, with RE4's perspective and gameplay and RE7's graphics. We were incredibly impressed with what we played at E3, with the layout and landmarks of the Raccoon City Police Station being easily recognizable from the 20-year-old original game and a fresh-faced Leon Kennedy moving, shooting and managing his inventory in a familiar but refined way. Like the original RE2 you'll be able to play through the game as Kennedy's rookie copper college student Claire Redfield, each telling a different side of the story. Loading playing in 5, one of the most iconic aspects of early Resident Evil is its knack for transforming mundane locations into impossibly convoluted, gothically beautiful locations, and the Raccoon City Police Station brings this back to the fore here. There's just no reason for a police station to have iron keys themed after card suits, or medallions that need to be fit into a statue in a certain sequence to open a passage, but the weirdness absolutely works. And, of course, the station is filled with zombies. Be warned, they are not easy to kill. 
The game's out on January 25th, sex, sea battles and Spartan kicks Assassin's Creed used to be all about climbing things, uncovering conspiracies and helping Leonardo da Vinci sort out his life. But while the series got lost for a while in strange time travel plotlines and the endlessly boring battle between Assassins and Templars, the last year's origin set the groundwork for massive change, keeping the core tenets of the games while opening up the structure, introducing broad role-playing game elements and giving the player more agency over the story and main character. Now, with Odyssey, it's doubling down. Set in Greece during the Peloponnesian War, Odyssey is set even further back in history than the last game, meaning even less of the secret order and conspiracy stuff. Instead, the two opposing forces are the Athenians and the Spartans, and rather than engage in a series of contrived missions you're free to explore and choose when and how you'll get involved in the conflict. For the first time you can also choose whether you'd like to play as a male, Alexios, or female, Cassandra, which says a lot about the RPG direction the series is headed. Indeed when we played a good chunk of the game at E3, between leading naval assaults, infiltrating temples loosing hilarious Spartan kicks at just about everyone, we were surprised at how many characters we had the option to befriend, romance or dub across. Loading playing in 5, the implication of the title seems like it might be a bit highbrow for this game, I don't recall any references in Homer's epic poem to sharks leaping out of the water to eat a bunch of Spartans he just shot out of boats with flaming arrows, but it's all in good fun. Aside from the move towards open-world role-playing, Odyssey is more colorful and fantastical than any other game in the series. From magical flaming swords to the aforementioned 300 style kick, both of which are abilities you can unlock with experience points, there's a new attitude here I can't wait to see more of when the game launches on October 5th. Come home to Kintori visiting older games and locations is nothing new for the long-running Pokemon saga, but while the upcoming Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee are ostensibly remakes of Pokemon Yellow for the Game Boy Color, they also push the games forward with a few series firsts. To start with, these are Switch games and so can be played on a big screen TV. But more noticeably, they borrow a lot from the mobile phenomenon Pokemon Go, acting as a sort of bridge between the more casual app experience and the more hardcore and traditional portable gaming one. We played the game with the Pokeball Plus, a weird little peripheral that's part controller and part Tamagotchi. It has a stick on the top for running around the world, and you click it in to confirm actions. A button on the back lets you access menus. It works fine as a one-handed controller, after all, the original game only had two buttons, but the real novelty is that catching a Pokémon makes the ball rattle around as though something is inside, and the monster's distinctive cry calls out from within. When you're not playing, you can keep a favorite Pokémon in the ball and take it with you out and about. Loading playing in 5, the demo took place in the beautiful Viridian Forest, now rendered in HD but easily recognizable from the original game. The big departure is that wild Pokémon do not randomly attack from the long grass, instead roaming about in plain sight for you to engage or avoid. Wild Pokémon battles are straight out of go, with players throwing balls by physically flicking the controller and paying attention to their timing in order to grow their collection. Battling other trainers, however, is just like it always has been in the core game. Your party of six Pokémon each have four moves at their disposal, and you and your opponent take it in turns to issue commands. This is shaping up to be a lot of fun, although there are still plenty of details that remain unclear. All will be revealed when the games arrive on November 16th, Lara takes a long, dark look at herself. Tomb Raider of 2013 was probably one of the most successful reboots in gaming's history, turning Lara Croft, an emotionless 90s sex symbol who was the least interesting part of the games she starred in, into a relatable character you could actually become invested in. As she embraced her destiny as a tomb raiding, mercenary killing, wilderness surviving commando, she also had to deal with the consequences to herself and others. The sequel Rise saw Lara fully commit to her role as a benevolent desecrator of ancient civilizations, while also expanding the gameplay to become the most fun the series had ever been.
Now, in bringing this trilogy to a close, Shadow of the Tomb Raider appears to pit Lara against her most destructive foe, her relentless obsession to succeed at all costs. Over the course of the E3 demo we saw Lara on a warpath to get to a mystical artifact, a knife, which was also being sought by a man named Dominguez. Lara gets there first, but in her desperation to keep the powerful relic out of her rival's hands, she describes the man as a monster, but the demo left his intentions very ambiguous, she snatches it and runs. The next removal triggers a flood that decimates a small Mexican town, but even when Dominguez blames her for setting the apocalypse in motion and sets off to avert it, and even when Lara's friend Jonas straight up calls her a narcissist, she's determined to make things right by heading to the next tomb. Loading playing in 5, along the way we partook in some familiar gunplay and stealthy stabbing, and the kind of engrossing environmental puzzles the rebooted series has consistently done so well. Mainstays like the bow and climbing hooks return, but Lara now also has the ability to repel and swing on a rope, as well as explore underwater ruins. These new mechanics, which take the game to darker, murkier places than seen in the last two games, seem built consciously to complement the darker state of mind our heroine finds herself with, and as long as the whole thing can avoid being too gratuitously grim it could end up being the greatest adventure of the three. It stores on September 14th, the author traveled to California as a guest of Microsoft.